Hello everyone, uh, my name is Raj and today I'm going to talk about wo our work on BPF termination. So we all are here because we have we all love BPF for one or the other reasons. Why we love BPF is because of the safety and termination guarantee it provides. What it means is that an administrator who wants to install a piece of code on a runtime is ensured that this piece of code cannot stall or crash the kernel. So termination as a guarantee is ensured by the verifier by traversing the whole BPF program to ensure the whole program is a directed acyclic graph. On top of it, because of the instruction limit stack and nesting limits, we always know that a BPF program will always end in an insignificant time. Now, the word insignificant here is quite subjective. And this is because of several recently added helper functions. Now, these helper functions have something in common here. They all iterate on a list and then call on call call on a user provided callback function. Now, depending on how large the list is or how costly that callback function is, each of these helper functions can execute for a really long time. To take an example here, here is a simple program, BPF program having two nested loops with some iterations. And at the end, we are just printing hello world. Now, this innocent looking BPF program has a runtime of about two minutes, which is insane if you are completely stalling the CPU for about two minutes. And depending on how much nesting you add or how many zeros you add on the iterations, we can easily increase this two minutes to several hours. So even though termination was guaranteed, fast termination was not. And this calls for a runtime mechanism through which we can kill BPF programs whenever needed. Now, before we go on to the challenges, I want to talk about some use cases of dynamic termination. So far, we talked about the long runtime case where a BP program ends up running for an unexpectedly long time. It can further have two different use cases, not very different, actually slightly related. Abrupt termination is where an administrator or an observability tool, let's say, finds out that one of the CPU is getting stalled because of a BPF program. In that case, they would want to kill this BPF program. And another example is about BPF orchestrator. Let's say we want to replace an old version of a BPF program with a new version. Now, depending on the severity or the priority of this whole event of replacing one BPF with another BPF program, we might want to do this as, as fast as possible and not even wait for the prior execution to complete. So this calls all for the orchestration use case. There is another sub umbrella within the, so not sub umbrella actually, it's a sub use case in dynamic termination. That's the unexpected runtime state. So we just saw about the use case of BPF, BPF exceptions when if, a, if the programmer decides that because of several reasons of some helpers or some allocations failed or something else, if the programmer decided that it does not want to continue any further, they can call a BPF throw and call an exception. Now, it's the exception runtime to responsibility to clean up all the resources and abort the BPF program. Similarly, talking about stack exhaustion, that is one of the talks my lab mates Siddharth and Roop are going to give in a bit. This is to give a spoiler. They proved that using several nested BPF programs, we can exceed more than the 16 KB kernel stack, and which can lead to stack overflow. So what we would want here is that the moment we are we see that the stack is going to get overflowed now, we abort the previous bloating BPF program and save the day. So we just saw about some possible use cases about dynamic termination. Now let's talk about the challenges, like why cannot we just kill a BPF program? What's so difficult about it? So about a generic kernel thread, we have the obvious problems of memory leaks and deadlocks because in a generic kernel code, we have no idea about how many resources are currently allocated. So if we just choose a random point and terminate it, we will have the heap memory, which is not freed. We have the locks, which is already there, and someone else might be deadlocked on it. So these problems are there. But because of BPF, we are getting an advantage here. Because of that static traverse, static analysis done by the verifier, we have a bookkeeping maintained internally by the verifier. So at any given point within the BPF, we know what, what are the objects which are live and what of them are not. However, there is one problem still remaining. Whenever BPF makes a helper call, these helper functions are nothing but kernel functions. And the verifier has no idea about what is going inside these helper functions. So we get the same problem that if a helper function is executing and we end up killing in between that, we will still have resources in the helpers which are not freed up. So memory leaks and deadlocks again. 
So two issues we have here. The first one is, how do we track these objects which needs to be freed up? We need to track these resources to clean them, clean them when termination was requested. And the second issue is, how do we know when should we terminate and when should we not? So in this case, we should never be terminating when a BPF is currently executing a helper call. So to deal with these two issues, we will be talking about two separate approaches. The explicit approach is the one which we tried and have, okay, we will go on with that further in a bit. And after discussing the explicit approach, we will go on with the implicit approach where we propose the fast part termination. So let's move on to explicit approach. Now, since BPF bytecode does not originally have any sort of, I mean, let's say talk about a C++ program or a C program. A C program does not have any kind of garbage collection happening. So to provide that, we can have manually or explicitly manage the lifetimes. Now, for this, to, for, this, uh, for this case, what we can do is we can have some sort of allocation list or any other data structure, where for every allocation and deallocation, we log some information. Now, whenever we want to terminate, we can just iterate that list and find all the resources which are not deallocated yet. So this way, we can implement a manual garbage collection. There is an obvious problem to this is that even though termination is not required, we will still be logging information to the data structure. So this is a runtime overhead for even no termination cases. There is a second not so obvious disadvantage of this approach, and that is that we saw previously that BPF has this information somewhere or the else, the verifier bookkeeping. But this explicit approach of garbage collection is not leveraging that fact. So this is an this is a indirect disadvantage we are seeing here, and that why we are not leveraging an information. So that brings us to an optimized way that we can generate landing pads during the verification step itself. So that we can say as the C++ style unwinding, where we pre-generate landing pads, and whenever termination is called for, we jump to a relevant point in that landing pad. So this is the industry standard way, and most modern programming languages are using this technique right now. And the big advantage we get here is that until someone calls for termination, it has zero overhead. So we just saw how we can deal with the first issue about how to track lifetimes. Now talking about how to deal with when can we unwind. This is the place where we uh, talk about safe termination points. What does this mean is that whenever we are not in the BPF text, let's say we are in a helper execution, that is an unsafe point, and we want to not terminate when we are at that unsafe point. Another way to say that is that whenever we are in the BPF text, that's a safe termination place, and we can trigger termination if we want to. Now, how do we know if we are in a safe zone or not? So there, there could be several approaches. I want to discuss two of them here. One of them is a basic flag check approach where we modify every helper call, and we check for this flag. If the flag is true, instead of running our original helper logic, we will go and we will take the execution to our cleanup mechanism. And this flag check will be happening every time, so there is a runtime overhead associated. Another better way to, to remove the runtime overhead would be to install k probes. The idea here is we install k probes on each of the BPF instructions, and the moment a helper function returns back to the BPF text, one of these k probes will get fired, and we will get the execution control again. And from there, we can start our cleanup procedure. So we just discussed the explicit termination approach. And there are some shortcomings for both the approaches we discussed. So for the GC approach, we had the obvious problem of runtime overheads. But regarding the unwind table, even though this is an industry-wide way, accepted way to deal with cleanups, the problem is that it brings a lot of complexity to the Linux kernel. If we are generating landing pads during the verification step, there are still a lot number of steps which is happening from the BPF bytecode to the x86 translation or any other machine code. So there can be function inlinings, that code eliminations, or several, uh, several iterations of JIT optimizations. And for each of these steps, what it means is we have to synchronize that landing pad, the unwind table accordingly. And if we have any sort of bugs or incorrectness in that landing pad, we are inviting invalid memory access problems. So all in all, we are, we are weakening the memory safety guarantees here. Now let's talk about the implicit approach. But before that, let's quickly summarize what has happened so far. 
So C originally had no lifetime managements. To deal with that, what we proposed is we explicitly de deal with all the resources and propose the garbage collection approach. But we realized that BPF Verifier is giving us this advantage of managing lifetimes. So to leverage that, we said that why not make generate landing pads during the verification step itself. However, there is a third property which we are not leveraging yet. The property that the verifier also restricted the control flow. So there cannot be any infinite loops. The, num the size of the BP program is limited. All of this comes under the restricted control flow property, and we are not leveraging this yet. So can we do something about this? Here comes the implicit lifetime management approach we are talking about. The idea is, since BPF verifier already does the branch traversal, it gives an assuredly that every branch, no matter what is the runtime state or what helper returns during runtime, et cetera, no matter what, every branch will perform cleanup. And that's, what, that's where the memory safety property is coming from. So another way to put this is that the BP program already encodes cleanup. So if we know that the program will always clean up automatically, why not just accelerate the whole execution in some way so that the program will always terminate and always clean up before terminating? So this accelerated execution is what we are calling as fast part termination approach. And here is the steps we are going to follow for fast part termination. Fast part termination is about dynamically patching BPF programs whenever termination is called for. And the patch program will be a faster, but yet a safe version. There are two steps involved. When termination is called for, we patch away all the helper calls so that we get a fast fall through. But again, the step two is that step one is not completely true. We have to selectively leave those helper calls which are freeing up resources. Now, what these two steps mean, we will go through that in a visual explainer now. Let's say this is a BPF program having a bunch of allocations and deallocations happening. And there is also one of these long running BPF helper function calls like the BPF loop or it could be anything else. Now let's say the first allocation happened and we have the first object with us right now. And then we get the kill signal. So as per our the two steps we discussed, we are going to patch away all the helper calls here, but selectively leave only the freeing up helper calls. So what we did is that we stripped off all the helpers from the BPF and only the simple BPF ALU instructions would be remaining. Now, as the verifiers would have already imposed a null check for all the resource allocations, we are leveraging on this fa fact that when forcing these helpers to fail, we will be forcing the program to take the nearest exit route. Now, this is what we are calling as the fast fall through here. Now, at the end, the, the last free call will be executed, and this is what we are saying as implicit lifetime management. Even if, even if we force the helpers to fail, we still are assured that these exit routes will still clean up before terminating the BP program. Now, we are making an important assumption here. The assumption is that by making these helper fails, we are like assuming the programmer would have checked for the failures and would have done taken the right step for it. However, spoiler, this is not always true, and we are going to talk about that in a bit. So we talked about issue one in the implicit approach, how to track lifetimes. Now talking about the second issue, when to trigger unwind. Unlike the implicit approach, we don't have the concept, we don't need the concept of safe termination points here. It is, all, it is going to be always safe to patch a program. However, there is another kind of problem involved. It is, we need to be sure that we are atomically patching the instructions. The point to note here is that this BP program will already be executing. And if we try to mangle it during the execution, we might end up in an inconsistent state. So for that, we need some level of at least the instruction level atomicity while patching it. However, to avoid all of this, uh, this game, another simpler way would be to hold the execution temporarily, apply the patch, synchronize this patch for to all the CPUs, and then let it resume. A way to do this would be, again, we can use reuse the flag or the keeper approach we discussed in the implicit section. And just that, the, way, the reason why we would be using the flag check or the keeper approach is not different. So coming back to the motivation here, we saw these long running helper functions and how they can end up executing this BP program for several hours. 
Now, in this case, let's say the program we were discussing before, we actually ended up running the BPF loop, and now it's running for a real long time. And what can we do about this? So what we found is that the long-running helpers are actually coming, always comes under two categories. The first category is when these helper functions keeps giving back the BPF program the decision whether they want to continue the execution or not. So if you see an example here, in this example, a BPF program is calling the BPF for each map element helper. And this helper is now iterating through each element of the map and calling back the callback function, which is a logger just printing the object. So in this case, what we can see is that depending on the return value, the helper decides whether it wants to continue the execution or not. So what we can do is cleverly pass the return value upon termination request so that we use the existing facility of early exiting this, this long running helper function. So this case is valid for the three of the four helper functions we saw. However, for the last, B, last helper function we saw, which is the BPF find VMA, this does not hold true. This comes under the second category where this helper is just another long running helper function. How? Let's see that. So in this case, we again call this long running helper. And we see that it is calling this kernel function called find VMA, which goes and traverses a maple tree to find out the correct VMA object. And only if the correct VMA object is found, it calls the callback function. So in this case, we see that the long runtime is not because of the BPF program, but because of the kernel code, because of a piece of kernel code. And in this case, the observation here is that we cannot safely terminate in any way if a kernel code is responsible for long runtime. We can only safely terminate when BPF is responsible for long runtimes. So coming back to the assumption we talked about previously, the assumption that all helper functions do have a failure case which is checked currently. However, that does not hold true. We found two examples. One is the BPF spin lock helper function and one is the BPF ref count acquire K func. In both these cases, it is always implicit. I mean, in BPF spin lock, it is always applied. In the ref count acquire, it is often applied that the failure case will not be needed to be checked. So if you see the example for spin locks, we always know that the spin lock is going to succeed and we will only go to the critical section after the lock is acquired. However, if we want to patch this program so that the spin lock starts returning error cases, we need to deal with those error cases and only go to the critical section when the error didn't happen. We want a similar kind of change to be made in all the helper or k-funks, which are not having error checks mandatory right now. And this will make the whole BPF more of a termination compliant. So what did we gain from the fast path approach, from the implicit lifetime management approach? First of all, we removed the complexity which a probable landing pad approach will bring into the kernel. The complexity of managing the landing pads through several layers of translation process, we are removing that. And by removing that, we are assured that there, can't, there cannot be any bugs in the landing pad which could end up weakening the memory safety properties. But however, we have some limitations of this approach. The first limitation is that we propose some changes and in the some of the helper and k-funks to make it more BPF compliant. However, that means that we are putting more baggage on the BPF programmer to check for more and more failure cases in their BPF programs. However, a point I would like to make here is that the verifier already imposes a lot of these programming practices on the programmer so that to basically ensure safety, to basically ensure that if an allocation is not happening, we don't end up dereferencing null values. So we are just trying to make that programming practice more consistent by adding these compliancy proposals. Now, the second limitation here is that even though we passed away all the helper functions, which we believe is the meat of the whole execution time of any BPF program, we still have left with the simple BPF instructions. Now, when, even after the program is passed, those simple BPF instructions will be executed and it will take some amount of, it will bring some amount of delay. So this is a delayed termination approach, approach and it won't be giving an immediate termination. The last point I want to make here is that whatever objects were allocated before the termination happened, let's say we got a map object, we got a kernel pointer or anything like that. Even after we have called for termination, those objects could still be modified. 
Now, depending on the use cases, if that is too severe, a programmer can make more checks to, to check whether a termination was called for or not. But that basically means you are circling back to more baggage on a BPF program. So we just discussed, discussed the implicit approach. And we are towards the, the last part of the presentation here. So what did we take away from the fast part termination? In the fast part termination, we tried to leverage the fact that BPF program already encodes cleanup. And this, this is pretty unique to BPF because in other programming languages, we are almost not sure that a programmer is always responsibly cleaning up the resources they have acquired. There could be inherent runtimes which are doing that for the programmer, but often it, a programmer cannot be trusted. However, in case of BPF, we are getting this unique property and we leverage that. Also, because of the control flow restrictions, we could, we could think that we can just accelerate and be sure that a program will terminate. It won't keep, in, keep looping back and forth, and there won't be ever a chance that we never terminate. Now, then we propose that we can patch a BPF program to accelerate the execution. And towards the end, we saw that how the long running helpers can also be leveraged based on the fact that if they are switching back and forth between the BPF and kernel, and they support early exit through return values, then we can leverage that and pass the BPF program for that. Now we come to the summary of the whole presentation. We saw that BPF termination is a two part problem. The first problem is how to know which resources to clean up during termination, which is how to track live objects. And the second is how or when can we trigger unwind. We saw how it is not safe to trigger a termination when we are within a helper function. Now, then we saw a couple of explicit lifetime management approaches, the list and the unwind table approach. They all had their own runtime overheads or complexity issues. And then we moved on to propose the fast part termination. And towards the end, we made some assumptions and then tried to make the whole BPF more termination compliant by proposing further changes on some of the helper or kernel functions. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. And thank you. Any questions? Um, I have a question, maybe. So in, in terms of, you mentioned earlier, like this uh, kill signal, right? Like how would you go and implement that? Because oftentimes BPF program is not its own process, right? So it cannot, it would affect like that process that it's currently running under. And then the question is like, what about this, this race condition? Like until the time when you would go and patch something, right? I mean, it still is executing. And then what, and, and then what about other programs? I mean, other events that would trigger that program because it's the same text section that you would patch, right? So they would be affected as well. Yeah, actually for the text section problem, we think that at least we can have a per CPU BPF text section so that if you are patching in one of the CPUs, at least the other processes are not getting um, interfered. Or another, another way to think with that would be, okay, again, just to take more clarification, is the question that once we have terminated a program, is the problem that we still would end up triggering the same patch program? Or is the question that another parallelly running process can still execute that BPF program? So I need that clarification. I mean, others could, I mean, I don't know, let's say like a log balance or whatever you, that you have, right? I mean, other, other like there could, be processed in parallel from other CPUs as well, and they would probably be affected too. But like, I mean, like this, this patching, unpatching is like, how would you ensure that it's only affecting the, 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 the program code that is currently running that you actually want to terminate, but not others that are okay, right? That, that do not hit this condition, for example. Okay, actually, yeah. So talking back about the per CPU thing, I think that if the problem is that parallelly some other program can start running that same BPF program, then we can introduce this, the BPF text as a per CPU text and not the global text. However, the, there is indeed a limitation that in the same CPU, if someone, some other process wants to execute that BPF program, then yeah, this is a problem which is not solved yet.
Yeah, because it can be like, I don't know, a million packets per second running the same program. And if you patch one, you drop all the other packets as well. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? If you have, say, an XDP program, which is load balancing packets, and you run, run on the same CPU, you have like hardware queue receiving packets. And if you patch the text, you will affect all the other like million packets per second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This could be a problem in the C yeah, this could be a, a thing, but the another way to look at this would be that most of the time the XDP and the network packet dealing BPF programs are not really long running. So in a way we can say that these network packet and the and this section of BPF which deal with networking applications won't does not really run, run, run for a long time. So most of the time we are looking at the probing or other use cases where we can try to traverse the VM and do some debugging or observability. And in that case, we end up running for a, getting a long execution. Yeah, and do you have an example of uh, like use case which happened in production where your program runs like for a second when it doesn't use printk but just like a real, yeah. real, real example? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. So right now, I don't believe there is a, an example on open source. But we believe that as the complexity of these BP programs will increase and these, the whole infrastructure will get more and more complex is that when one BP program is getting uploaded, it might be interacting with other BP programs. Or we might be trying to call the find VMA, let's say the find VMA helper, and that the developer might not be expecting there would be a large number of VMA lists depending on how many lists they are. Because if there are like, each objects are of very large size, then so if, if there are several objects in the VMA list, then even though the helper was expecting this, even though the programmer was expecting it to return quickly, but during some corner case during the execution, we will get, end up having a big list which will be iterated like forever. So that is one of the probable use cases we are seeing that, and that is something we are envisioning when the whole system gets more and more complex. More BPF programs or the BPF infrastructure complexity in itself is increasing. So we are envisioning this problem to come like in some time. Thank you for a very interesting talk. One more question. Uh, in So like this is actually a really interesting idea of uh, reusing the program itself to do this fast pass execution to accelerate it to release the resources. But it will only release the resources that has to be released within the program lifetime, like spin logs. So this approach is like very interesting and will apply to things like spin logs mostly and where they have to be released for the, within the lifetime of one program. But anything like a socket ref counts or any KFUNCs that do acquire, they won't be, right? So the, the cleanup pass might not exist inside the program because the resources are staying longer than the program itself. So you cannot reuse the execution of the program where the signal happens to do the cleanup of all of the things. Like let's say like uh, task struct acquisition, kfunk, it will just like increment the ref count, it will stay there. So if you just like continue and you patch all the calls inside that, that particular program, it will just continue. So you still need probably to solve this problem in combination of the approaches of one that Kumar just presented of actually like analyzing the code and seeing what the program acquired in this asynchronous kind of way and releasing it separately. And so, and spin locks, for example, yes, they can be used by this accelerated path. But it's, it's great that uh, like different people working on a similar problem from like very different angles. It means well that the problem is real and we'll solve it eventually. Yeah, I would like something on that point actually. So along with spin locks, we also like plan to deal with the allocations, other allocations as well. Like let's say talk about ref counts. So when we try to, when we get a ref count, then we also have to put the ref count as well at the end. So while we increment the ref count at the beginning, we also try to decrement before exiting. So the idea here is that we don't patch away those put reference count helper functions or k-funks, so that even those k's could be dealt with in this proposed approach. So do you think that could solve this issue? Send the patches, we'll see. It's uh, hard yeah. to see it's working, but yeah, looks very interesting. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you.